Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Flying Cat Marketing Interview Series. It's been a while since I've recorded. Uh, there was summer. I was traveling, took a month off, which I'm pretty excited about, and then went to California for Saster. And now we're back with the first episode uh, in the fall, recording now in September. I have Casey Hill with me, who's the head of growth at Bonjoro and a new dad. Uh, how's it going, Casey? It's going amazing. Yeah, it's a it's a whirlwind with uh with the new kid here and and all the plates up in the air, but but I'm loving it. Thanks for having me. Oh yeah, I'm really excited to talk about uh what we're going to talk about today, which is how to four x reach with repurposing a playbook. You have you talk about this all the time. You're so much about repurposing. I see you all the time in in Slack channels as well. <clears throat> Uh, and also in the SaaS Talk newsletter, I've been getting all of your emails from there and Growth Corner, your newsletter, which I'm also part of, so uh, a subscriber of. So let's talk about it. Um, before we get into the conversation, what is your background with repurposing? I know you are on, you you create a piece of content, you put it on LinkedIn, Reddit, Slack channels everywhere. Can you tell me your just mini case study that you're getting this experience from? Yeah, I guess a couple angles to kind of speak to that. I guess first is kind of like a well, why do we do it, right? Like what is the what is the application behind that? And I think that this kind of started with the idea that when I was starting to share content across two, three, four channels in the beginning, right? Now I might do that across 10, 15 channels. I just started to notice that we got substantially more awareness, more leads, more responses, more inbound requests from the exact same piece of content. So I think that part of the genesis of just getting more involved in repurposing and looking at more outlets of that is like, hey, how can we take this content piece, which we've taken all this energy and time to create and make sure that we get more bandwidth out of it? Um, so I think that's how, like, I guess, is the rationale behind where I started first doing it. And I think when it comes to repurposing, there's kind of two sides of it. There's, I guess, taking it and, and resharing it, making some minor modifications across different channels. And then there's like this idea of, oh, hey, we did a podcast and we can take little clips from it and we can now, and there's kind of like the, when people think of repurposing, they often think of that second one, which is also part of this, which is how do you take, say, video content and take snippets and utilize it in all of these different ways. And then there's kind of like almost resharing which I'm using somewhat synonymously, like resharing content in different channels. So I think both of those are important as part of kind of a, a repurposing strategy, I guess. And there's also taking that kind of video content and turning it into different media as well, right? So you can take the clips, turn it into a graphic or turn it into a text post. There's just so many different ways. That's not only specific to resharing it across different channels, but actually just creating new pieces of content. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that was kind of like what I was trying to articulate with that second category is like, how are you taking one chunk of content and, yeah. and using that as tactfully as possible in, in different ways? Okay. So I feel like we, you just covered this question, but for those who are thinking this is actually a lot of effort uh, what are some some reasons that a content team might want to repurpose content? Yeah, I, th I think it's really down to impact, right? So when you when you put out content, you have an objective, right? All of us who I think work in the content world, we're beholden to KPIs and we have different things that we want to achieve with that. Might be more MQLs generated. It might, you know, there's a whole range. We won't go into all of the kind of reporting side of this, but you have those specific objectives. So I think if you're if you're looking to say, how can I get substantially more results with the same amount of content? I think that's where this conversation becomes really important. And I think it's an it's a opportunity on both kind of like building a good distribution plan essentially means that for less total content production, you're able to get that much more actual output. And so I think that's why this kind of conversation is important. So I think ultimately it's like, it might seem like it takes more time but the alternative is you're just going to have to churn out that much more content to stay at that same bar of production. So essentially, you're like, you can produce two content pieces with a really good amplification or repurposing plan, or you can produce six content pieces. So you kind of have to make that decision about like, you know, which one of those better serves you. And I think oftentimes, you can make those two content pieces that much more robust and quality and choose that first route and do it a lot more efficiently. And 
And I think one of the things we might get into on this call is there's often a lot of misconceptions about how much more time it often even takes. I think the bar is much lower. There's been kind of this thing that is perpetuated out there that you have to choose like one channel, go really deep on that one channel, embrace that. And that is the only way for you to have kind of an effective content strategy because you don't have quote unquote time to work across five to 10. My argument is that that's a little bit more nuanced than that appears. Yes, you might not be able to be spending hours each day in all of these and commenting and doing these different things, but it doesn't mean you can't have a wide range of channels that you use as part of a repurposing or distribution plan. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So what I've been seeing a lot of companies do in terms of distribution strategy. So let's say you're creating either a podcast, then you distribute it through Spotify, uh, Apple Music, Apple Podcasts, whatever, all these different channels. And then they probably take that link and share it on social. Um, and to me, that's not really a distribution strategy or they'll email it again. They'll email it out to their newsletter or something like that. And just sharing that one piece of content. So when you're talking about a distribution strategy, cause you talk about repurposing distribution and amplification, but it sounds like you're sort of using those terms, uh, interchangeably. Um, so when you talk about a distribution strategy, how is that different from what most companies are doing when they think that they have a distribution strategy. Yeah, for sure. So I think that distribution strategy is probably one of the biggest weak points when I step in with organizations. So what most companies do is they produce a piece of content, be it a blog, a podcast, whatever they post it. And then they might share it across all of their like social handles and send it to their email list. And that's kind of their definition of a distribution strategy. I think first part of a distribution strategy is who else externally is going to help you amplify this. That could be partners, it could be PR outlets, it could be, there's a whole range of different things that you could do. There's this idea of amplification and having that as part of a distribution strategy you're putting out. So I think the first thing I would say is when most people think of a distribution strategy, they think about 100% internally. They think of it, what is our team doing and what are our people doing to put this thing out there? When we produce content at Bonjoro and same thing for many of our clients, we're constantly asking ourselves, how do we get other people who serve the same core markets to distribute this message, to distribute this content, right? And that might come in a lot of forms. Some of it might be finding the right podcasts and having conversations on those so you reach those audiences. Some of that might be integration partners. Some of it might be affiliate partners, collaborative partners. So part of this starts with saying, who else is gonna amplify? The next part is actually just being purposeful to create a content calendar that has distribution at a core, uh, as kind of a core part of this. And so what I mean by that is, instead of just taking content and publishing it all out when it, when it happens, you have a concerted plan of, you know, where you're running a webinar, where other people are sharing, where social content is going out, and you actually write out a distribution plan. So like when we create our distribution plan, we have a list of all the partners who might be good people to share this out. We have a list of the social like PR style outlets that might want to amplify this. So what is the core narrative around what we're producing that FastSpring, Forbes, TechCrunch, all these other outlets be willing to pick up? So part of what we try to do is we try to take a step back and say like, you want to produce content that is not so product centric that other people don't want to share it. Because that's one of the first complaints I get is people say, Casey, like, I don't quite know what you're saying. Like, why would some other random people want to share my product release piece? Right. And I'm saying, well, you need to understand why this is broadly applicable to a degree enough that people would want to share it, that it's part of some sort of trajectory in the market that has that broad applicability. Right. And so I think that is, is part of the game right? Uh, of, of what you're trying to do when it comes to, to building a distribution strategy. Well, it kind of sounds like the content that you create has to be newsworthy then in that case. Yeah. Newsworthy or, or basically some, I, I think the first answer I would say is like, yes. And broadly speaking, it's like, is there a core audience who gets inherent value? I mean, this is kind of going into like what makes good content in general. But it's like one of the litmus tests I tell my students when they're producing content at university is, can someone read this? 
make no buy decisions and still receive value. They're better off and they can solve some sort of problem or they're more advanced reading your content without taking any future decisions. And so that's where it starts, right? Is like something that's that's there. And as broad as you can attach this to some sort of trend or some sort of shift in the market, I think the better. So to just give maybe like a little bit of a specific example to help couch this. So we might say something to the effect of, we, we at Bonjoro have a product that allows you to collect video testimonials, but we would never start there. We would start with something like this. Most website reviews today suck. They don't build any confidence. You go on, you see a little one line quote. It doesn't influence you in any way. You don't even know if it's real or if someone that's contrived and someone created it. So the whole right now is that these testimonials are not specific. They're not long enough to build context. They're not using video so you don't see visuals. And that's how we would approach it. So we're talking about a topic that a lot of people could see and kind of resonate with and be like, yeah, you know what? When I see those little one line quotes, those don't really influence me very much either. And that's broad enough that it can capture a lot of attention that other people would want to share about it, that hosts would want to have us on shows to talk about how can you build trust the right way. And yet all of it still funnels back to a product that we offer. So there's still this direct application, but we're not talking about our product. Mm -hmm. So so that's kind of the idea that I think we're trying to get at. And I think if you do a good job of that keystone belief at the top, your distribution plan will be, you'll have more capacity within that distribution plan. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about amplification. I just want to go back to that because you're making a lot of reference to like, who would want to share this? Um, Do you have to, so you have a list of partners and I assume that these partners are regularly sharing content that you publish. Uh, what's the strategy there? Are you incentivizing them? Are you rotating who you ask, uh, depending on the kinds of content that you publish? Because I assume you're still publishing pretty frequently, even if you're doing this distribution strategy, how do you get people to do that beside just writing a lot of value in the content. Yeah. To me, I really focus extremely hard on alignment. So I think where most people miss here is they kind of like, they try to push too far out of someone's native zone. And so what I mean by that is like, I really try to get to know, like we have a couple hundred affiliate partners. That's one category. We have a a handful of people who we've done kind of collaborative partnerships with. And then we have people that we've worked with in the media in various capacities. So I really want to know exactly, like when it comes to the media, I know the beats that those journalists cover. So I'm never going to pitch them a story that isn't directly aligned on those beats. When it comes to affiliate partners, again, it's very tightly aligned. Like I might have one affiliate partner who I know they work super deep in HubSpot. They work super deep in active campaign. That's the alignment there. If I produce content that's about Bonjoro plus HubSpot, right? And something like solving a very specific problem, that's the person I'll go to, but I'm not going to go anything outside of that. So I make sure that, you know, your, your network and the trust that you build there is super critical. And you don't want to ever put people into situations where they're like feeling uncomfortable because they value you as a partner, but they're like, ah, I don't really, it doesn't quite make sense. So I think for me, it's less about like frequency. Cause sometimes we'll have a bunch of content lined up. We're doing say a focus in a key area. We'll do a bunch of collaborations back to back. And other times we won't talk to that person for say six months from a redistribution standpoint. Right. But I think that's, that's the key is to segment and have really good data about what do they care about? Who are their audience and make sure that that content elevates or, or has some sort of advantage to them. We don't focus on the affiliate angle. We don't incentivize this. We don't pay these people in any way. Um, We've never paid for redistribution in that capacity, right? So it's, it's, we've done like sponsorships before, but that's a a different bucket. But for this, I think it's all just about that alignment piece. Oh, okay. Love that. In terms of practicalities, um, the way that they are sharing, amplifying the content, is it they're sending it out to their email newsletter? Are you rewriting about that content as a guest post? Uh, or are they just sharing it to social? Like what, what is the way that they actually amplify your content? Yeah, great question. Um, all of the above have happened. So we don't, we don't specify, right? Like we don't go in and tell someone like, you need to distribute it like this, right? Like we'll normally reach out and sit, talk about how we have an interesting angle around a certain topic and like, hey, this seems aligned with your audience. We're going to be publishing it on Thursday, like blah, blah, blah. And we'll kind of start with just presenting that information to them. If the person responds back and says like, oh yeah, that's awesome. Like we'd love to reshare it. 
then we might get into like coordination of how we could do that tactfully. Like, oh, we're going to do it on Thursday. It would be awesome if you guys did it on Thursday to have us kind of hit this at the same time. But we don't tell people like, can you post this on your social channels? Like that's not the type of dynamic. We always are, are coming at it from an angle of, here's something that I feel like might be interesting in your community. Or, hey, we saw actually that you guys were just posting two weeks ago about X. You know, we're actually doing an article covering the same topic, but from this kind of different angle, if this would be interesting, like just wanted to share it with you. And by the way, we just actually shared your piece with our community because we loved your insight about X. So there's reciprocity and it doesn't feel like this. I think a big thing is like, it's not this pay to play. It's not this like, can you do a favor for me? I think if done right, this feels like it's just, it's actually beneficial for them and you're, you're helping each other, right? Versus kind of like, can you help me? Which over time is going to get, you know, kind of old. So I think, I think it's the subtleties of those really matter a lot. Okay, so it sounds like you've been doing this for a while. You've probably made some mistakes along the way. Uh, what were your biggest trial and error mistakes or, or things that, that you've learned to change now in terms of repurposing and amplification? Yeah, for sure. So I think that one of the first ones, kind of starting from the top with repurposing. So today, if I go to repurpose a piece of content, I will take that piece of content, I'll post it on LinkedIn, And then I'll find other long form channels. So I'll go to Reddit forward slash SAS forward slash venture capital. I'll post there. No character limit. So easy, done. I'll go to Facebook, communities like SAS founders. Um, There's a whole bunch of different like growth communities that are in like the SAS space, SAS marketer. There's a whole bunch of them. I'll post where applicable in those communities. Again, no character cap. So super easy. Right now, I just took one channel and I just put it now in seven different places, eight different places, just from sub communities within those spots. Then there's certain Slack communities like Demand Curve that are very active and are good quality communities that I can then take content and repurpose it there. So I think going through that process of repurposing long form content across long form channels is a way that I make it really efficient. So I guess like my first mistake, I think was this fact that I think I felt that I had to spend extensive time inside of every single one of the groups or channels that I repurposed within or else it wouldn't work. What I found is that I've chosen a couple channels to spend a lot of time. Primarily right now it's Facebook and LinkedIn and the others I just repurpose, but I still will be able to get an extra 30, 50,000 in my best months, a hundred thousand through communities like Reddit right? By simply taking that content and just posting it in, leaving it there. And like, I might occasionally hop in and comment on a Reddit thread, but like by and large, I don't engage in a lot of those channels. And so I think that it went from, I'm going to repurpose to three channels because that's all the places I have bandwidth to, to like spend time in, to I'm going to repurpose across 20 channels, but stay active in three. And I think the difference of that was a post that would do 20,000 views on LinkedIn, I'm now getting 100,000 views and probably four to five X the amount of inbound attention. And by attention, I mean like people reaching out with comments, people trialing the product, that type of thing with this new model of having the 20 channels, but three more active. And so I think that is definitely like a, a big learning. I think the other piece going to, the other piece I think is really around like a good amplification distribution plan, which is this idea that I I think that in the beginning, and this is what many people do, is just publishing content in a vacuum. By a vacuum, I mean you just publish it to your own audiences, your own handles. So I think that that was a mistake that I made for a long time. And then podcasting was actually one of the first things that opened up that experience for me. I said, hey, I can add value to people and have these conversations with this tar- these target audiences and still have this have back applicability to my product and my business and the message I'm trying to get out. Because if we go back to the example, like with website reviews, this is the kind of thing we can provide education and guidance on in a valuable way, but it's not directly on the nose. And I can now speak to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. So I think, I think those two pillars were two of the biggest kind of missed opportunity. And I guess the final thing I'll say is 
it was only about maybe a year or so ago, I was talking with some of my mentors in the industry who were running much larger organizations. And they started saying like, where's your distribution plan? And I, I, at the time I didn't know, like I wasn't familiar. I was like, well, I have a content calendar. And they asked me those same kind of questions. Well, who <laughs> outside is helping you get this in front of more eyes? And I didn't have a good answer. And they said, when you launch content, where is your like concerted plan of where you're redistributing? And I didn't have a good answer. And so I've started to internalize that. And as a person who's like, when I hear these insights, I'm a testing data-driven person. So I'm like, I'm just going to test this. And I saw how much of a night and day change it was in terms of the impact, in terms of the longevity of that content. And that has made me a very strong convert to now being very organized. And when you build content, build a distribution plan, build a repurposing plan, post when exactly it's going out, when you're going to get other partners to go out. And if you can't, this is another thing too, you can't always control when outside parties are going to publish content. But what you can do is you can have structured times in your calendar where you're outreaching. So let's say you produce a piece of content. You internally plan to post on it about this. Uh, on Monday, you're going to do a blog. On Wednesday, you're going to do a webinar, etc. internally. On your calendar, also put, I'm going to pitch five podcasts on Monday. On Tuesday, I'm going to reach out to these three PR outlets, right? On Wednesday, I'm going to contact these 10 partners. So you can't know that those partners or PR outlets or podcasts or whatever are going to feature you, but you can structure the outreach as part of a plan to make sure that it's not just like, oh, we made this content and I'm going to reach out to people whenever. It's like, no, that's actually like as important as this post is scheduled to go out at 3 p.m. It's equally important for you to have that distribution arm as part of that conversation. I love this. I, I hope that my marketing manager, who is a solo marketer right now, is listening to this episode. She should because she's producing it. <laughs> um, take note. This is something that we should do. Uh, shout out to Mila. You're the best. Um, so how, uh, how do you actually measure success in terms of the channels that you're sharing in, the partners? Do you have some kind of UTM? I guess it's not UT UTM because a lot of the times you're sharing natively to those channels, right? So what is it that you do to see what's working or not? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, so attribution is really interesting. And at university, I teach about all the different types of attribution and the models and stuff. But funny enough, I think that one of the things that I like to do the most is just directly ask people. Super simple, right? On an intake form, you ask people, how do you hear about us? Right? And what it does is it tells you a couple things. Number one, it's like what they value most. So there might be a couple touch points, but when you ask how you hear about us, they're going to like, what they choose to tell you is interesting. But two, it's what's given us all of our data around podcasting because we don't have control over UTMs and outside channels like that. Um, same thing with PR outlets. We don't have control, but we can ask someone, how do you hear about us? And they can say Forbes or they can say the SPI podcast or whatever different thing. And that's how we get a sense. Like when we look at our data and we're like, we're driving 30 paid customers a month from podcasting. It's because people have directly told us. Now, is that figure an exact figure? Yeah. No, but I think most people would argue, like I would argue that it's, if anything, an underestimation, right? It's very likely that the total impact is actually much higher. If we get 30 paid customers who said they heard about us from podcasts, it's probably 50% above that. So it's, it's, it's going to be like the minimum bar of yeah. people that came from that channel. So I think that's one of the first ways we look at it. And we, it's interesting that we tend to look at a lot of end metrics. So like I was part of a research study on, on podcast advertising and podcasting in general. And everyone was talking about awareness, right? They were like, oh, this is all about awareness. I think in many ways, podcasts are at kind of the awareness stage. But we look at podcasting actually from a paid accounts that come from podcasting standpoint. So that's interesting, right? Like very few people do that. But we literally are like, oh, hey, we were on 18 podcasts this month and or 18 podcasts that published this month, for example. And we have 29 people that put that they heard about us from pot. So we'll actually create that kind of like direct attribution. Yeah. So we do look at MQLs. We do look at awareness and like some of those vanity metrics at the top to get some directional sense of how things are going, especially on social. But at the end of the day, we're very much focused on trials and paid accounts. Love that. Those are the important things to optimize for anyway. 
Um, okay, so just last question because we're almost out of time here. You mentioned, I think it's interesting because you were talking about how on Reddit and those kind of channels you were trying to engage before you realized that's not scalable, you don't have enough time, and now you're not doing it. Um, I know that from my experience and probably other people who have been on Reddit, some of those places are scary. <laughs> they, yeah. are, they will, they, they don't appreciate this, this kind of like just posting and ghosting, I guess. Um, so how do you, what, do you have a process? I mean, I guess you already have all of your channels listed out, but in finding the right channels that it works, how, how do you make sure that your repurposed content is fit for that channel and for that audience? And, and what do you do to adapt it for each? Yeah, it's a good question. So first, as a quick note on Reddit, like Reddit is really interesting, right? It's like one of those that gets a lot of attention because they're like incredibly intense about being non-promotional. And I've absolutely gotten posts before, like I had a post where I was actually talking about one of my mentors, Patrick Campbell from ProfitWell and like what I respected he did about the industry and basically people responded and they were like, you're paid media from ProfitWell and like you're infiltrate, like it was just this whole funny thing. Like Reddit is intense like that, but I actually purposely like publishing on Reddit because of the test that it makes you go through. You have to be purely non-promotional, right? To succeed on Reddit. So that's a good actually test as a writer. If you can find success on Reddit, to me, that's a litmus test that your content is non-promotional enough, right? So it's not that I'm telling everyone that they should go spend all their time on Reddit. Like again, I repurpose on Reddit, but I don't spend all my time engaging on Reddit. But I do think that Reddit is a good example of testing. If all the stuff you publish on Reddit always gets deleted, removed, whatever, it's too promotional. So, so I just want to say that about Reddit because I think it's yeah. a good testing ground. But in terms of what community specifically work for you, for me, this was the idea of if you start wide, right? So you start with all the possible communities that might make sense. Let's say I, I have 40 communities that might make sense. So I start publishing content. I see who's responding. As people respond, I start to comment. I start to see what the engagement patterns are. I start to see what type of customers, Hey, this community, I'm getting great engagement. I had one community. I got insane engagement, you know, 30, 50 comments, but they weren't the right type of folks. They were kind of the entrepreneur. Like I just could tell the alignment wasn't perfect. So that's, that's not bad, but I, I gradually stepped away from that community because it wasn't really my core audience. So I started to look not only at where am I getting engagement, but where are these, the right folks and over time, I could make those signals of like, wow, SaaS Founders is a great community. I get a lot of inbound requests. People ask me questions. These are senior leaders, C-class executives in this kind of industry and space that I operate in. So that's a community I want to stay in, right? And so I think the, to me, the answer is if people are thinking about how to approach this, start wide, repurpose that content. And when I say repurpose, like start by kind of like sharing across channels that don't require a ton of modification. So maybe that's a better way of saying what I was talking about when I say long form is if you have 10 different channels that all don't make you clip that content and modify in a ton of ways, that's a great starting point. And then there will be those channels that do require you to do that. So you might say, okay, then I'm going to take this shortened clip and I'm going to use that on Twitter. I'm going to use that on Instagram, you know, on those different types of channels. So I think it's like almost this idea of like, you're trying to think of how do you do it as time efficiently as possible, right? And, and it's interesting. I had a guest lecturer named Todd from Refine Labs who came on to talk to my university class about TikTok because I know nothing about TikTok. So I was like trying to grab industry experts. And he said something that stuck with me, which I, I want to share because it's so relevant to repurposing. He said, a lot of times we'll build content on TikTok because the editor is super easy. And then we publish that onto LinkedIn LinkedIn is actually our focus, like where we're trying to get traction. Whatever happens on TikTok is just bonus. We know that B2B isn't big on TikTok right now, but we figure why not? We can build it, publish it on TikTok, repurpose it on LinkedIn, which yeah. is our main channel. It takes us almost no extra time. And I guess that's one of the major things that I want people to hopefully draw from this conversation is when you're thinking about taking that one piece of content and moving it across 20 channels or building it on TikTok and then sharing it on LinkedIn, think about how can I spend five more minutes to get this in front of substantially more people? And that I think is part of the idea of kind of like what we're talking about when we talk about repurposing. Yeah, it's really what can you, how can you make the biggest impact with the lowest effort? Yeah. And I love that approach to it. 
Casey, um, we're out of time now. Thank you. I, this was so valuable. I'm going to share it with my team as well. I really want them to listen to this and do the same thing. Um, there's a lot of places we can reach you. What, what's the place you want people to go to? Yeah. So, to so people to can always go, um, find me on LinkedIn and I can provide a, a link for you. I publish a lot of content on LinkedIn. So if people are, are interested in topics like this, absolutely. Um, I work for a company called Bonjoro.com. So if people want to go check that out, please feel free to as well. That's a video email and video testimonial gathering tool. Those are the two best spots. All right. Excellent. Well, for those who are listening or watching, thanks for your attention. If you liked it, please do share. <laughs> um, as you know, it's the topic of the, of the episode. Anyway, please do share, give it a like, subscribe. Let us know that you watched. And Casey, thank you so much. Have a great day. You as well. Cheers. And that's the end of the podcast right there. Hope you enjoyed the episode, but please don't go just yet. If you did enjoy this episode, please leave us a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It'll help other people like you discover us and get the same insights, and it would really help us out a lot. Um, thank you for being a loyal flying cat and for listening. See you next time.